Decision-making in, in, in public policy has become extremely complicated. This is a complicated society. It's getting more so. And the pressures are to have a very simplistic public debate. The political pressures are all geared towards the next day's news cycle, if that, if that long. And um, the intensity of pressure to do short-term decision-making is actually very intense. In business as well, of course, it's very hard to, uh, not to look at your quarterly share price if you're in business. I can't imagine any company getting away with saying, we think quarterly is too frequent, actually, so if you don't mind, investors, we'll go back to annual reports only. Looking at the way the technological changes have driven change in financial markets, uh, changing the media, changing the way businesses operate and, and people work, it's become clear that a lot of institutions have not managed to keep pace with those sorts of changes and are not um, doing what they ought to be doing very effectively. In particular, failing to adapt to the challenges of the new technologies and the way um, there are some extremely difficult long-term challenges such as global warming, um, such as demographic change and, and globalisation. A real mismatch between the capability of the institutions and the challenges that they're facing. And I think there's no question that we've got to some kind of breaking point. The financial system is not fixed. The crisis could happen again tomorrow, and there's behaviour in the markets that suggests that it might. So then you ask yourself, what can we do about it? And one answer that's often given is that, well, we should just stop growing, because after all, growth doesn't make anybody happy. Now, it has become received wisdom that money doesn't make you happy, more GDP doesn't make people any happier. And this is um, something that economists refer to as the Easterlin paradox. Richard Easterlin, back in the 1970s, noted that in any cross-section of people in one country, the richer people were happier than the poorer people. But if you looked at what happened to countries over time, as they got richer in terms of GDP per capita, they didn't seem to get any happier. But if you stop to think about what you're measuring, then I think it's quite easy to see why the Easterlin paradox is, is not real. GDP is an artificial construct. It can, you know, can add anything into it that you think is reflecting economic activity, and it can rise to that limit. It could go up to a gazillion if, if, uh, we, if the economy grows that much. Happiness is measured on a scale, one, two, and three. It's asked, people are asked in surveys how happy they feel. So it can only go up to three when everybody's perfectly happy, and we're at 2.6 at the moment in the UK and the US for all our all our flaws, it just can't go up any much more. When you deal with a statistical problem and you turn GDP into something that has approaches a limit by taking the logarithm, then you find that there's a really strong link between happiness and GDP. Now, GDP growth isn't the only thing that matters. It measures what it measures. It's a measure of economic activity, and there are lots of other things that matter to us. There's a great example in Australia. They ask people what they care about, and they have an annual report called Measuring Aust Australia's Progress, where they report on the indicators that people have told them really matter. And they do include quality of life and environmental indicators. That's fantastic, and of course we should do that. But I think also you have to accept that GDP is an indicator of greater well-being. The most important aspect of it is the innovation and variety that increases in GDP bring us. It's not that we're getting more of the same stuff all the time, it's that we're getting better stuff and, and, and different kinds of stuff. In his uh, terrific history David, uh, of the world, e the world economy, David Landis points out that Nathan Mayer Rothschild, who was the richest man of his time, died because of the want of a $10 antibiotic in today's prices. Um, these innovations really do increase people's well-being. But the key question then becomes, if actually having more GDP from year to year does matter, then we need to find the right balance between the present and the future. So broadly speaking, what is sustainable growth? The debate amongst serious economists about responding to the environmental challenge is entirely about this question of how do you weight the future as against the present? It's not about the climate science at all. I don't think serious people challenge that. On measurement, what we're looking at in GDP is just today, it's the flows of things that happened this year. What we're ignoring is wealth, and economic statistics are really poor on looking at wealth, but you'd never assess a company without looking at its balance sheet as well as its, its income flows. And economists have started to work on a measure called comprehensive wealth for a few countries, which looks at financial assets, physical infrastructure, 
but also human capital and environmental assets, everything from biodiversity and clean air to the mineral resources. And the important thing about measuring assets is that you can tell when you're eating capital to consume today. And so having a frequent measure of changes in, in these different forms of wealth, as well as a measure of the flow of income from year to year, would be a really important weapon in the armory of taking longer-term decisions and moving towards sustainability. On institutions, I think um, uh, they're important because they capture the sharing of knowledge between individuals and from one generation to the next. Institutions really matter. A market is an institution. Um, civil society institutions are part of the economy. And to be able to take decisions that really take us towards sustainability, institutions need legitimacy and they need effectiveness. Effectiveness is about responding to the technological challenges and legitimacy is about responding to people's concerns. They interact, of course. People become concerned because they know some things but not others. And the story that measurements and data tell people are very important in working towards solutions. So, what to do about it? And I wish I could say there was an easy answer. I don't think there is. But I divide it into three. One is better measurement, which sounds like it's something for anoraks, but I, I really think it's fundamentally important, not least because it gives people in public life and in politics the kind of weapon that they need to challenge short-term pressures. I, I wouldn't worry about happiness. I don't think it's costing the ONS very much money to ask people how happy they are, but I think we urgently need to put more resources into measuring the country's assets, its wealth, and a wider range of indicators, a dashboard as well as GDP. The second is institutional reform. I don't think the world is flat, but it is transparent. And the only way to avoid the pressures of hyperpopulism um, is going to be by more and not less engagement in, in public debate and an online debate. And you, you can't sack the people, you're going to have to talk to them if you're in any, any position of public responsibility. And then finally, I'm going to talk about something that's really unfashionable in economics, and that's about the sense of values that we have in running the economy. Capitalism will only work if it has an ethical compass, and I think that has been lost. I mean, really, we want three things from the economy. We want efficiency, we want freedom, and we want fairness. And it's quite hard to achieve the right balance between the three of them. And Western economists have been rather focused on, on the efficiency and the growth, and on the freedom and individual choice, and have overlooked the fairness, which is fundamentally important in human society. I think that's, that's very clear from the scientific evidence. So there's a kind of trilemma. How do you navigate your way amongst these three things? Do you think that uh, part of this kind of shift to a different way of thinking, to longer-term thinking, also requires us to move beyond a kind of national frame of reference in relation to economic uh, policy? Well, I think it does, but of course global governance is very hard. Some of the structures that we have now only came about because of the absolute crisis of the Second World War and it's proven very difficult to change them without a crisis of similar magnitude. And I'm not sure one would want to have that kind of crisis to give global governance a bit of a, bit of a leg up. I mean, we, people thought Gordon Brown, of course, hoped that the credit crunch would be that crisis, but... Well, everybody hoped so, but I, I fear that actually there's been a failure of global governance in responding to the banking crisis. I'm amazed at the power of the threat of certain banks to leave London. The ones that say they're going to leave are going to leave anyway because their business is moving. Standard Chartered, HSBC, are basically Asian banks with a lot of Asian business. I think, at any way, they will move their headquarters sooner or later. I'm really disappointed in the failure of nerve by international financial regulators to respond effectively to the banking crisis. But it's, it, global governance is really hard to do, and I don't know that there's anything other than step-by-step step trying to improve things that one can do about it. Uh, and the kind of core question that you, that it's the, the, the centre of this book, which is this kind of issue of the long term versus the short term, how we can bring the long term into the short term. What do you think is the basis for our frailty in that regard? Uh, it, so is this kind of deeply I intrinsic human frailty that we have, or is it something which you think is becoming worse in the modern world, because we live in a world which people argue moves much more quickly, we're overloaded with information, it's harder and harder for us to kind of stand back and to think in these ways? Well, it may be human frailty, but in the past, people have found ways of getting around the human frailty, and that's what institutions are for. That, that's what buys people into a longer-term perspective. I think one important thing we have lost is a sense of progress, the sense that it's worth doing. And, of course, that strong sense of, of progress and possibility was a really 
marked feature of the Victorian age. Economists would call it expectations. You've got to have expectations that the future is going to pay back enough, in a sense, to make it, to make it worth doing. So um, I, there may be psychological frailties, but I think they can be overcome, and I would hope that we can do it. We have this fundamental problem of stewardship. Uh, people don't own companies. Most of our companies are not in any sense owned by anybody. They're owned by institutions who own little tiny fragments of them uh, and aren't willing to invest in that stewardship. Do you, do you have hopes that we can tackle this stewardship issue, or is it going to rely upon enlightened leaders of this kind who have the kind of strength of will or the, the good fortune to demand that kind of space as a, against shareholder pressure? I think there's some hope for overcoming it. One problem is that institutional investors interpret their, sense, their, their understanding of fiduciary duty as getting the highest possible short-term return. I don't think they need to do that, or small tweaks in legislation could change that, and they could, be, uh, they could uphold their duties with a longer-term perspective. So I think that's one, one possible change. A lot of companies don't actually raise very much money on the stock market anymore. If we um, took share prices out of any executive remuneration package, they wouldn't have any reason to care much about their share price. So I think that's another quite practical change that one could make. And I do think the values are shifting, actually.